All right, guys, welcome back to the MVM Show. I'm Titus, your host, as usual. And here today I'm joined by Kent Dingler. Have you been on the podcast yet? Never been on the podcast. This is your initial First time. time. It won't be your last, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta, I want to get the guys together. I only have four headsets, so I can only get three of you, but I was thinking about last night maybe getting... You guys decide how you want to mix it up. It's either going to be like me, you, Jack, Nate, and then Cole... Cole, Morgan, me, or something. We'll have yeah. to, but I want to get you, I want to do more than just one-on-ones, but anyways, welcome, and thank you for doing this. We're up here camping. This is another Camping Chronicle. <laughs> That's what I've been calling it, so this is uh, number six, and then you see me writing some notes on my phone. I'm just taking notes for future reference, but okay. so I don't think I'm ignoring you, but anyways, glad you came on, and it's good to be here. A couple days, been trying to like link up, but Riding dirt bikes, going on hikes. You guys went to San Joaquin. Yeah, I should get your perspective on that too, because Justin <laughs> came on here, and gave his perspective, <laughs> and it was pretty good though. Similar to mine, <laughs> <Probably>. painful. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, um, the first story I want to go over. We talked about this. We're trying to figure out how to do this the best way. We're like, do we want to? Yeah. Do you and Cole together, or do this separately? So, you guys shot something pretty incredible. Was that two seasons ago? So this is my fifth season, and that was the first season. That's the second season. I shot that Mallard, and then that would be the, it was the third season. So, so two seasons ago. Two seasons ago. Okay. So, man, I don't want to kill a story because it's like <laughs> right when you tell it, it's pretty crazy. But why don't you tell us about? I guess I'm just gonna say. It. So you shot Eurasian Eurasian Widgeon. Yeah. And it's more to the story that you can tell the whole thing, but I don't want to kill all of it. But start us out. Prior to that day, and like, did you draw the? Did you draw a resi or did you sweat line that? So that day, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was like a high resi. It was like the last one they gave. Okay. So, or it was either like we had a really good lottery. So what happened that day was, well, I take that back. The week before, or like the last hunt day, I think it was a Wednesday we went, and then uh, Jack had been out there in that same pond that week before, and he was like telling us, "Oh, it's just insane out there." Like it had been a good year up to that point, but mm-hmm. it was like. He was trying to figure out where it was good, where there was birds. And Jack had said, like, you guys need to be in this pond. He was going to go to somewhere else because he was more going for the mallards and stuff like mm-hmm. that. So he's like, if you guys want woods and a pintail, he's like, that's the place to be. So we got there that morning, and it was me, my brother, Cole, and my dad, Kenny Dingler. So we got there in the morning, and it was a Wednesday, so there wasn't too many people there in the parking lot. And uh, – Jack was there. He actually had a resi two before us. So he walks up there and he checks his pond. He's all like, he's like, Hey, that pond I was there. He's like, it's still open. I was like, okay. So we wait and he goes out and sure enough, we walk to the window. It's like probably the best out of the three there. So we were like, okay, we'll take it. It was, uh, I think it was mid December. I want to say mm-hmm. something like that. It was pouring down rain and just not too crazy windy, but just it was rained all day the whole time we were out there. Got up there that morning, got set up, and it's almost like it was like perfect. It's like shoot time kicked on, and then that's where the birds just it was crazy. Like you were on the X. It was on the X. It was like I've never seen anything like that that day. It mm-hmm. was just a complete just tornado of widgeon and pintails all day to circle in that pond. Mm-hmm. Never seen anything like it. And we start out that morning, Cole shoots a speck, shot some pintails, shot some shovelers, shot some widgeon. And I want to say it was getting toward like I want to say it was eight or nine o'clock, and this group of what was the weather like? You said raining. It was pouring down rain all morning. The whole time you were shooting, it was raining. Was it windy? It was. It was. It wasn't crazy windy, but it was breezy. Was it a south or north wind? South. Okay, that's why. I wonder if that was the day that two years ago when me Jack. No, Jack was there. Never mind. That's a different day. Okay. Jack, that same morning, him and his dad went out and shot like nine mallards out of that. Okay. Yeah. That was, I remember his hunt, but I wasn't. Yeah. I was wondering if that was when we were at a different refuge and it was me, Barney, Shane, and Jack, but that was a totally different day. Barney was hunting that day because he was like one of the first person that people I called. I think hmm. he was at San Luis, I think. Okay. So all of a sudden, just kind of just hunting this flock of widgeon, I want to say it was between like seven, maybe between seven and nine, eight, somewhere mm-hmm. in there. I could be wrong on that. And uh, they started circling at me and my brother just started calling at him. The birds weren't, like, super responsive. Mm-hmm. They were just there. That was just kind of like this scenario. Just kind of one of those things, like, we came that morning, they were 
covered that pond up, but you could tell like we put decoys out there and they weren't they were weary of it. <clears throat> we had mojos out. So we actually pulled had pulled some most of our decoys out and the mojos and just had like a couple out there and we immediately saw a response. And this flock of widgeons start circling around. We're calling at them. And then they just kind of, you know, started that pulling away. Like they didn't want to come in. Yeah. So Cole just said, you know what, I'm just gonna take a shot. I wanna say he was like it was like thirty 40 yards mm -hmm. it was a pretty long shot he shoots it i think i fired a shot i'm not sure i don't think i pulled a gun up dad i think shot a couple times and cole i think on the third shell a widget just out of this flock just falls and it falls and hits the water and i'd said it before but i never really specified but once that bird hit the water i just i was like i was like man that's a pretty widget out there i was looking i was like that's a good looking bird. So we start walking up to it and as Cole's getting up to it, I'm, I seen the head and I said, there's no way I just pulled my phone out and started. Video what were you, you were just literally saying there's no, Oh, you have that clip. I have the clip of walking up. He didn't know I was videoing. Like I was like, he was just like, no way. As I got that just right. That part, him and the dog are running out there and I'm like, there's no way it's like 50 yards out there. We start walking out there and he pulls it up. He's just freaking out. Euro, there's no sinking away. And Coco goes to grab the bird, and Cole just said, no, not today. Yeah, <laughs> man, not today. <laughs> Grabbed it in front of her. So then he shoots up, but we're freaking out. I'm calling people left and right. and uh, That's the studliest Euro I've, I've ever seen. I've never seen a that, – that, yeah. I've not even seen one – I mean, maybe a couple mounts on, like, a website of, like, a you know, a tax right. that's taking a picture of it. But I've never seen one like that. I don't even think in, on mounts. The coloring was just – it is about as studded out as you possibly can get. Yeah. Definitely not a young bird. No. You know, I don't know how old, but that, well, anyways, go ahead. Yeah. So, yeah, you so were calling did, everybody. I was You're, calling Did everyone. you Marco Polo? You were sitting on the Marco? Did Did no? we even have the ducks? Polo? That's what I'm not wondering. So that was three years ago? Yeah. It's it, been around it, a long time. It, yeah, it's three yeah, years ago. To, unless you weren't on it. I wasn't on it. Cole might have been. Okay. Cole would have Marco did, if anything. So I'm calling everyone. I'm calling left to right. I called, I called Nate, Nathaniel. And he called, he answers, and he just was like, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. He just kind of laughed it off. I was like, no, 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 I promise. I sent him a picture, and he's all like, kind of waited, didn't get a response. He's all like, okay, I believe you now. <laughs> <laughs> I better. <laughs> <laughs> then I actually, so what happened then is I called, was Barney Hilton. I called him up, and I told him what happened. He's all, he was all happy for Cole and whatever. Then we were like, my dad, just being him, he's all like, all right, that's enough, Cole. Let's get down and finish our yeah. limits off. Because there were still birds just flying around the whole time. So we all get set up again, and I'm, I don't think we shot a, another bird between the next bird we shot. I think it was that next one. So it was like 10, 20 minutes, somewhere in there. This, it was like, there was a flock of three, I believe, and one had broke off and was just kind of circling us, and the other two were just kind of doing the same exact thing, just they were separate. They were together, okay. came together, but they separated. And circles around, and... Did the same almost the same exact thing as cold bird. And I was like looking at it and I was like, I was like, what are the odds that's another euro? But I just it was so it was so cloudy and dark, I could we couldn't right. even see the bird until we got up to him. Right. So dad is sitting there and my dad was like, forget this, I'm gonna just pull him up and shoot. So he shoots at this bird, boom, 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 fires three shots at it. And I I look down and I'm all like, I'm like, well, it was hurt, it got wounded in the wing. So it starts like circling around, but it wasn't going down. It just was like stuck in a circle. And I'm all like, this bird is either going to go into a tulip patch or is this going to get enough wind to just fly away? So I pull up and I shoot, boom, knock it down. This dies. Get out there and I'm all like walking out toward it. And I'm like, okay. So get all the way up to the bird. And I just look down at it. I said, there's no stinking way. Pull it up out of the water. I said, it's another one. It was another stinking Drake Euro. Unbelievable. Yeah. How much does it freak out all over again? We, or honest, was it not as much? Honestly, we we talk me and Cole talk about it a little bit. We hadn't like like you and Travis had been hunting for years mm -hmm. and just had like had the experience of just dreaming for that type mm -hmm. of a bird. We knew how rare it was because we'd hunted a couple years, but I don't think we truly were able to appreciate it as much as somebody else. So like we pulled up, we were like we just were kind of in shock. It's right. like is this like normally happen <laughs> or is this just kind of like this this rare crazy thing that's right. happened? Freak deal. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind and of so, weird. It, so it was almost kind of like you're in a little bit of a haze because it was just so like, like surreal. Or do you are you saying it's just because you weren't doing it long enough yet? You yeah, didn't have the same. It was kind of a combination of both. Both, yeah, yeah. And mine, mine was 
It was well, like, plus birds are still flying. Right. As this is happening, right? Yeah, oh, the whole time. It was like nonstop all day. Till we left, people I'm sure filled that film and shot on two more limits. Yeah. It was just that kind of day. Yeah. Mine bird wasn't even close to the It was still level. nice. It was but, still a nice Yeah, but, but not even close. It to wasn't the... even, didn't even scratch the surface to Coles. Yeah. Not even mine. I mean, it was, it, the Coles is just a stupid, it was ridiculously yeah. plumed. I told bird. him it was like a girl standing every day in the mirror just brushing his feathers out all the time. <laughs> literally <laughs> literally dude i mean the most reddish rusty color. just and then the patch the cream patch on top and then that green on its wing is Man, just amazing such an amazing bird but i mean the fact so he, those were back to back birds then they were 10 15 minute 10 10 20 minutes apart apart but it was the next bird killed i believe so that is unbelievable that well, makes you wonder if there was more that's what we talk about in that group that that flock I said there had to be that's what we that's what we think and what about the group group Cole shot his out of now you wonder like was there more in there well if you so the week before like a couple weeks before another guy shot a euro out of the same refuge we shot those two I came back on the last day of season and a guy shot a a, a widgeon euro hybrid out of that same refuge so wow. I I know of four birds that came over and you them. know and then I did it on the vet hunt and you shot that with the same it was the same euro yeah or? Yeah, five out of the same refuge. Wasn't it? Or was it? Wait a minute. It wasn't last year. It was a yes. It was two years ago. Yeah. So it was the same year. So that's five euros we know for sure that came out of that refuge. <laughs> what in the world? But now I will say that was the year of the widgeon. Like all, a lot of the refuges same were year. stacked with widgeon. Insane year. And I know around that time of that hunt was when me, Barney, Jack, Shane hunted and just wiped the widgeon out. Yeah. In fact, we, me and Barney were talking about on the last podcast. We were talking about that and how they had already shut their limits and then told Barney's like, you need to get out here. And then I went out there. Yeah. And then I think Talon, was that you and Talon showed up later? That was, that, that was, was that, that that day? That was like the last day of the season. Me and Talon went out later that, it was that season, I believe. In that same spot, right? No, we went to the back. Okay. And we went back there and it was Wednesday. We had church that night and it was like later in the season. So it was getting dark. Like, I want to say it was like. It was getting dark later, so church was starting earlier in the day. So, it was like, there was still light. So, we would, we, I shot, I think it was, like, four mallards and one w- widgeon, and sh- and Talon shot two mallards within, probably no joke, an hour and a half in the evening. Mm-hmm. Just didn't even expect it. The whole refuge wasn't even shooting birds. It was a sunny day, and just, that Talon. was the best. <laughs> it was just one of those, just kind of weird days. Just all of a sudden, one mallard come in, and then five minutes later, two more would show up. Then, ten minutes later, five more would come in. Just, just wanting it just coming in i've never i've never seen mallards do that was the first time i had experienced that mm-hmm. for myself <clears throat> how much more did that uh make you even worse than you already are for duck oh. hunting <laughs> <laughs> and it was like at the end of the season and i was like you're joking i'm not gonna have that right. experience this for like, the whole season it's like every experience makes you one way or the other i guess either you're just like less into it or you're more sold out you know for sure what do you think okay so I didn't prep. I didn't uh, prepare you for this question, but so when you first started five years ago, your mindset then to what it totally is now. Different. What, but what was what, what in what way? So let's think back to what how you would think about a hunt, do a hunt, decoys, shooting distance, everything about it. What you were like the first season, right? And then what you are like now. When I first started. We were more of along the lines of just, if it flies, it dies. Mm-hmm. That's kind of how our mindset went. So we were originally, how I got into hunting was the really first experience myself hunting was a, my grandpa owns an almond orchard and mm-hmm. we dove hunted. I dove hunted for, I've been hunting, dove hunting for seven, eight years since I was like 13, 14 years old. Mm-hmm. So we more just were along the lines of draw fast, shoot, you know, we, that's, that's kind of how we, how we roll. Well, I think as we've went along, Cole and Dad, kind of the same boat. We've we realized that you know we used to just take far shots, you know, load out decoys. Yeah, we, we're we're kind of known in our church to overdo it the decoys. Mm-hmm. I think the most we ever took out one time was like I think fifty seven mm-hmm. at a refuge. But as I've gone, as we've gotten more experience, we found out that more doesn't mean better. Mm-hmm. So I mean. I think as you just go, you just learn little things like that to not take those far shots and to um, not take as much because you don't, you find out you really don't need it at all. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of how things have kind of 
evolved and changed for us. Do you think any scenarios do call for a lot more decoys? I tend to take more decoys out on rainier and windy days. Mm -hmm. That's just kind of what we've just found out. We just found out because with it just storming, it's blowing those decoys around. It's just causing them. They can't tell the difference. So they get up there and they see that big old flock of birds and they're just like, they just come into yeah. it. But on sunnier and calm days, even if it's just a little bit of wind, I'll just, I've gotten, I think the least I've ever taken out was 10 maybe. Mm -hmm. I, I was just, this is kind of a lot for some, but I just spread my decoys out usually into two kind of groups. One on the right, way one on the left, 30, 40 yards apart. Mm. That's kind of the way we do it now. Yeah. And it's a lot easier to bring motion and life to 10 decoys exactly. versus 60 decoys. Exactly. And that's why, it, and I was just, I'm just asking and just seeing your thoughts yeah. and whatever, but that's my mindset too, because like, see on those windy, stormy days, you got all the movement you want in the yeah, world. Exactly. So you don't have to bring pulsators. You don't have to bring this and that and sh shakers and all this. You have the elements doing it for you. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And it's nice too when I have my, I have actually two, I have a younger brother too, but Cole, me and Cole, we can, we're capable of taking as much, um, thing, um, things as we need. Yeah. Cause we're, Cause both, he, we can both carry the weight. Yeah. yeah. And my dad can too. So if it's, you have three full capable men of taking out as much gear as you need. Right. And then I have my younger brother Boots coming up through the ranks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How's Boots? He's 13. Is he? Okay. 13. And Cole's 17? He's 17. He'll be 18 in August. Okay, next yeah. month. Okay. Oh, man. He, uh, that yeah. would, he messed, no more junior hunts for him. Yeah, it's messing us all up. because It's yeah. all on boots now. Yeah. Got to carry the family name. Then it's me, Cole, and Dad, which we're all going to be adults, so we're going to have to separate most refuges. Yeah. That's yep. what it's going to go. That's a bummer, too. Yeah. Man, that is, that's, a, that's a hard part. That's what's happened to Jake. And, yeah. Oh, no, they still can do it. Yeah. But it won't be much longer. They're not going to be able to do it either. Mm -hmm. And that is, a, that's a little bit of a, yeah, that's going to be hard. It, that's going to kind of bum you out of guys a little bit, it I is. think. It is because. And he, it not, it's not everywhere. It's not that you can't hunt together. It's right. just going in. Exactly. That's he, the tricky part. Most time we're sweat line or lottery. So that makes it always kind of difficult. And then most refugees only allow two adults and then two juniors per adult or one junior. Yeah. Something like that. Anything else that you could share from the beginning to now um, as far as changes you've made in duck hunting? What about like uh, ammo too? Does it matter to you what ammo versus what you were doing then? Do you think more about that now or does it really matter biggest, to you? The biggest thing for me as far as ammo is I found out the feet per second was the biggest deal for me and Cole. Because me and Cole, like, we just thought, Shotgun shells were shotgun shells. 12 gauge were 12 gauge, 20 gauge were 20 gauge. So we'd buy, you know, we'd go to the store and see the cheapest one or we want a more expensive hunt, we'd get this one. We weren't even looking at the feet per second. So we'd go to Volt or whatever refuge we were going out to and shoot amazing there. And we'd be like, all right, we're going to go up to further north and take a more expensive shell. Mm -hmm. And we'd just shoot trash. I'm talking like three boxes per like five birds. And we're like, what is going on here? And we realized... We're going up there and shooting fifteen hundred feet per second, and down here we're shooting thirteen fifty mm. feet per second. That was our biggest deal. I said that if we just we settled on what feet per second we wanted to shoot. Mm. We realized I think fifteen hundred, which is pretty high. I, that's what I tend to I like to shoot mm. my gun. Okay, so the you feel like the thirteen fifty was messing you up? It, it had to be because it was like it was like night and day. Because we always would get between three and four shots. That's kind of what we just keep our ballpark mm -hmm. in. This kind of we don't, don't really mess around with anything else. And it was like the only difference between any other shell was the feet per second. Mm -hmm. Just because it's just more powder versus others. Mm -hmm. That was yeah. our biggest deal. Yeah. Um, what we, this is going to put you on the spot and kind of like um, maybe have, make you to think for a second. Cause, but you're pretty quick-witted. So what do you think is like your craziest? Or, well, we'll do two things here. What's your craziest duck hunting story, which... Maybe that's hard to beat that Eurasian. That Euro was pretty crazy. Yeah, I don't know if that we maybe we already did that. What's your funniest duck hunting story to you? I think the mo funniest, which it wasn't, maybe it's like a funny thing that happened, but that the day I shot that Bandon Mallard was just mm -hmm. the whole day. Me and my dad just laughed the whole the whole day about it because we went out. It was literally my second year hunting, second first Wednesday of the year. And it was just like, what's going on here? We just, the whole home, we did the whole way home, we just laughed. 
my dad, I've never seen him just laugh over a, a one duck <laughs> the whole day. He just was just cracking up. Just like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> That's hilarious. So your did your dad? I can't remember. Did Kenny start the same time you guys did, or did he wait a season before he started getting we, into it? He waited a season. He did. So me and Cole, I I still kind of fuzzy on that, but I think it was Jake. Jake and Morgan and Nathaniel were just talking up a storm about it. Just you guys need to get it. You guys need to get into it. And we were just like. We're like, we're not duck hunters. We're fishermen. We don't do this. Yeah. That's not what we do. And we're like, we're just, then they started kind of showing us how they do it. And I'm like, well, you know, why not? You know, everyone else is kind of doing it. Why don't we just get a cheap pair of waders? Get a, we're going to, we like, we're, we're big gun people. Let's get yeah. some shotguns. Let's go try it out. The first, first hunt, I was like, okay, I could, I could do this. Tell me that first hunt. Did you go with Jake and them? So or? the first hunt we went on was me, Cole, Nathaniel Morgan, which were all the juniors, and Paul David and Jake. We went out on a, it was an opening morning, burning up. It was like high 90s. It was just miserable that day. But I remember that first morning, we were sweat line, I believe, something like that. And I remember me and Nathaniel, he was all like, he's like, you're fast. I was like, yeah. He's like, all right, you're going with me. So me and him took off running. That first morning, I shot, first duck I shot was a hen mallard. And then I shot a Drake green wing. Cole's first I think he shot. I want to say it was one, but man, I could be wrong. He only shot two. He shot. So you shot a Drake Mallard and a hen. It was a hen Mallard. Hen Mallard and a Drake Greenwing. Drake Greenwing. Okay. First, first hunt. Okay. Yeah. Was it? Was it good? Was the hunting good? It wasn't. I mean, it was steady. I'd say if anything, it wasn't. But none. I. I don't know if anybody. But anybody, you're trying to get used to shooting. Something yeah. Like that. I, I, it was the first time I had. Yeah. It was the first time I had. I had dove hunted, so it was, I. I kind of was a little bit prepared for it, mm-hmm. I guess. But it's just it's totally different. But that was yeah. a, that was a good morning. That same morning, that was that morning. Morgan shot that green wing in it. He shot it like way out of the sky and it landed in the sl- pile of ducks in the sled. Oh yeah, yeah. That same morning. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. So that was your first one. Did that hook you right there, or did it take you a while? Was it, it was like okay, that was fun, but it, it was, was fun. Like- it was it was fun. And I said I'm gonna do it again, but I don't think that first time I was like, I mean, just like, yeah, I love it. Straw struck. Yeah, I, yeah, I knew. People were all like, "He's like, you guys are gonna like." It. I was like, I, I, "I'm gonna go back." And as I started doing it more, got out doing it more by myself, mm-hmm. and just kind of just, kind of just got drawn to it. Yeah. I mean, how much do you like it now? Uh, it'd be pretty hard to. It, it, it only God can take that away. From me. <laughs> 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 only God can take it away. Oh boy, let's not let's not tempt him. You know, we don't want him to take something like, oh please, Lord, don't take. It. Don't you speak those words, Kent. You make me nervous. <laughs> oh man, uh, that's hilarious. <laughs> oh, that's the best response to that I've ever got so far. <laughs> oh man, I don't even think Kent can or Cole can beat that. <laughs> Oh my goodness! Okay, it's gonna be a god deal. Hey, seriously. Well, I don't know, man. Let's talk about. Let's talk a little bit about. We're gonna talk about your career pursuit, what you got going on. We're but let's talk a little bit more ducks. Um, so, uh, I don't know. I'm a. Are you? So, to me, for myself, this is what I think about myself. I think I'm a deep thinker, like mm. not just with duck hunting, but like everything I do. I think. I really put a lot of thought into it, and I have a lot of people told that like you think deep, man. And it's like yeah. I I didn't say I was smart. I just think deep. Like right. I really analyze stuff, maybe too much sometimes. I don't know. Are you more that like? Because I'm a firstborn. Right. You're a firstborn. Do you feel like you have that personality? I'm a pretty. I'm a. I think analytical, studying, watching, yeah. thinking, always trying something different. I don't know if you're quite like that or not. I think but. I think me, Cole, and Dad are a good combination for hunting hunting partners dad is more along the lines of kind of get the work done make sure everything goes planned he's mm-hmm. just the dad cole's more of the he just does the brunt work of it <laughs> get, <laughs> yeah. he's always packing stuff up getting things loaded up in the truck I, I do my part but i'm more of the i always like the more of a how do i say the paperwork kind of guy I'm always studying maps. Mm-hmm. Always, I'm, yeah. I, I'm the guy I put I put in for the resis. Always in the computer work, and I love to listen to like Ducks Unlimited podcast. Mm-hmm. I love like just studying how birds act, how yep. they work, and I I like to I'm trying I like to get into more. Of, I don't like to be stuck at one area, so mm-hmm. I branch out very broad. Yeah, you spend a lot of time on on foot. 
On foot, yeah, I do. Mm-hmm. I liked it. I've got. I got this past year was the first year I really kind of got kind of like started liking doing it. Was getting out and doing scouting at refuges, mm-hmm. even in the off season, mm-hmm. not just season in season. We're trying trying to get out on the rivers, take a look there because here in California, the Central Valley, you'll find out fast. There's not a whole lot of area to hunt. It's yeah. very, very outside like, of the refuges. Exactly, yeah. not like back especially getting permission and stuff like that yeah back east seems like you can just walk up to a door and just ask them mm-hmm. they'll you know hunt as far wherever you want to hunt basically mm-hmm. but out here you got to really really buckle down because there's you gotta put your work in hard exactly. extra work exactly yeah there's how many other people here in the state trying to do the same exact thing you're doing mm-hmm. so we really have a high high pressure for hunting here especially the past couple of years i've seen just even my five years I've hunted is the increase of hunting mm-hmm. and just how many people are really out there in the field. Yeah. Now th- me asking you that question right there, let me, um, let me ask you this. So if you're, you kind of are obviously an analytical person and you study and you look, you watch, you pay attention, you see birds, how they act at what, what makes them do this? What makes them do that? And that'll take a lifetime, right? It There's is. guys that are incredible and they still com- claim like, I, you know, I've been doing this for 40 years I still have so much to learn. They're, they're animals, right? There's, exactly. There's no one recipe for everything, right? Exactly. So asking you that, what I wanted to ask you was, you had some good points. You were talking about the decoys and how rainy days do this, and that's how mm-hmm. you do that. And and I like that because that's what I've studied and seen, right? Mm-hmm. And um, so that being said, as far as decoy, let's just go into decoys for a minute. Do you, are you at this point yet in your path of waterfowling? My journey. Yeah, your journey to where you're looking at what type, um, what species of decoy you're using. Do you think that matters? Do you have certain things you like to use at certain places? Or do you just throw 10 decoys out there? It doesn't matter if they're pitch, pintail, widgeon, mallards, what kind of hole you're in. Or do you have, before you go out there, you know where you're going. Exactly. And you know what type of the habitat is like, because we do have a lot of vari- variableness and do. types. Even for a small area, we have all oh, so many different kinds. So I, I know I probably know the answer to this question. I know you're thinking about that, but are you thinking about that? And what makes you pick and decide how you want to do things? No, for sure. For decoys, where it depends really depends on where I'm going. Mm-hmm. Is where that's the biggest factor. Because like I go up north and it's just widgeon and pintail. Mm-hmm. I go down here, it's more along the shoveler. Somewhat widgeon, somewhat gadwall. We really have a mixed, I say more of a mixed bag in the grasslands. Mm-hmm. Just kind of that's what I've seen. Seen like I go up north and it's just like mainly pintail, but right. then you see a lot more widgeon, a lot more geese. Mm-hmm. I tend to take geese more when we go up north. But as far as what I take out there, just what I've seen with how birds react to decoys, I don't think it really matters from a distance. But I have seen Birds land on birds. I've mm-hmm. had my flock of widgeon over here, and just the widgeon go over here, and the shovelers want the shovelers mm-hmm. over here. Mm-hmm. It really depends on how you set that up. If you set it up right, if you have your shovelers more along, just I tend to send more along the shallower parts, and the widgeon the deeper parts. Mm-hmm. It's kind of and it, but I've seen it too. Widgeon just land in the middle of my mallard pack mm-hmm. or my teal pack over here. Mm-hmm. There those days that really seem doesn't seem to matter. Right. I do tend to separate my mallards from my other ducks because mm-hmm. I've not seen mallards land with other ducks. They're sure. always with the mallards, right. and the mallards are always kind of just by themselves. Yep. So I always send them kind of just tucked away usually. my, And I tend to send my more like uh, dabblers, like widgeon, pintail, uh, shovelers, and teal. Those kind of more just in the open, mm-hmm. away from the mallards. Mm-hmm. I tend to separate those a lot. Mm-hmm. Just kind of what I've seen. What do you feel about <clears throat> uh, spinners? What's your thought process on that? <laughs> is it always a spinner? Got always no, have a spinner? No, 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 no. My dad is an always spinner guy. <laughs> he just he's always like he's like if those ducks can't see that spinner, you're doing something wrong. But my dad has got to the point where he's seen the days too. He's seen it now. He is. We they went up north one time, and him and Cole they shot that is that that, that he shot that redhead and he shot like mm-hmm. five gad wall, a redhead, drag gad wall, and uh, a shoveler. And it was literally they had the spinner out there. No, wait, they didn't have the spinner out there. They, I told them to hold it back because it was a sunny day. I was like, don't put it out there because I, I didn't go with them. I was hunting by myself down here, and they were all like, I was like, Kent, it's getting windy up. I was like, they'll try to throw the spinner out there. And kids, you know, he threw the spinner out there, and they shot like their limbs within just like that on a sunny mm-hmm. day. Mm-hmm. So in his head, 
Yeah, the spinner's got to be out exactly. there. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And if it, <laughs> and me and Cole sometimes in the morning, we're like, I don't think we should throw the spinner name. He's always giving a hard time about it. And then we don't shoot any ducks. And then he's like, I told you to throw the yep, spinner out yep. there. And then we throw it out there. He's all like, well, if you had the spinner out there all uh-huh. morning, we would have shot ducks. Mm-hmm. But he has seen, he's like, it does some days you want to pull it out. The two days I do tend to use it mostly is rainy, cloudy, windy days. Mm. I always throw the spinner out there just because for some reason, it's just that the weather just seems, it kind of throws them off. Yeah. That's what it just seems like. Maybe they're not getting a good of a look at it, exactly. too. And the they got to the motion, but they, yeah, the rain's hitting them, the wind, they're fighting the wind. They're, they see that flash, a sunny, clear day. They can hear, you know, there's no wind. They can, they're, by the way, ducks can hear. They can. For anybody that they thinks can. otherwise. I can't stand when you're across the pond and hear guys just, there's birds working, guys just blah, blah, blah. Here, here they come. I'm like, and you wonder why they're not going to you. <laughs> Ducks can't hear. They can't hear. Now, that being said, someone brought up a good point one time. When ducks are really moving fast, they're not just kind of floating around, like, getting ready to land, but they're actually cook. They're When you hear, you know, they're going 30, 40 miles an hour or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Think about what you stick your head out the window going 30, 40 miles an hour. Like, you can't really hear. No. Which brings up a point of calling See, I like, as birds are working in, you want it like less and less and quieter, quieter, quieter. As they get closer, right, you're like working them in. You know how it is. It's almost a natural thing. Like, I don't sit there and think how I do that. It's just natural now because yeah. I've done it so long. Yeah. But there has been times I'm like, man, that bird didn't act like it heard me. And I looking back, I'm thinking, they probably didn't really hear me, to be honest with you. Yeah. Because I do feel like you can blow birds out and over call so loud it flares them. Mm-hmm. I've seen that. Yeah. But then there's other times... Wind's blowing. They're flying fast, and I don't think they do, Harry. You know, no. so man, it's and that I feel like the calling part of it. You can be successful without a duck, duck call in your hand because Barney's like, I can't 100%. blow a duck call worth a flip. And I said, we were talking about that, and I and I know for a fact you cannot have a call. You cannot have a lanyard. You don't have to have none of that stuff. You have decoys, just a couple. You can still shoot birds, especially if you're on the X. You don't even need a decoy. Exactly. I've done that. I've had no decoys, and it it's a it's a little bit annoying when people act like you have to have decoys. I was like, that's not true at all. If you're on the X, they already went there. If birds that's want not, them, they're not going to go there. Yeah, exactly. But on the other hand, calling can make a significant difference. You I've know, seen, I've seen that too. too. So I think it's just wisdom and time. You've got to learn how to read the birds, right? You've got to know, like, just because I have a call my lantern does not mean I have to call them. Exactly. You know? And I've watched birds flare when you call, and you're like, well, shoot, that ain't going to work. And then the next one, they like it. Or I've watched birds where they like you to call all the way up into that 30-yard, 40-yard mark, and then you better shut it off or they're going to not finish. Not finish. And then in other states I've been in, you have to call to their feet or touching their toes or touching the water. And they will not come in unless you do that. Exactly. So really, bottom line, it comes down to, or, uh, let me say one more scenario. You don't put a peep on that call. Uh-huh. You don't till whistle. You don't widgeon whistle. You don't quack. You don't feed call. You don't do nothing. Because I know so many people that feel like they have to call. Yeah. I, I have to call. There's a duck I have to call. It's yeah. like that is such a misconception. It's kind of a go-to. Just like, it's just like a reaction. It's a habit. It is a reaction, yeah. a habit. And uh, I saw so many ducks over guys that were calling hard, and I just didn't make a peep, and they just decoy right in. I can't tell how many times I've done. In fact, I've got videos of me solo hunting. Um, in fact, the one I shot, like watch that video. You know what I'm talking about yeah. when I was in the pit. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, and that was a learning time for me too. You're like, I've been duck hunting for quite a while, but I tried some and it worked, right? Exactly. But I feel like all if you take the whole scope of things, it's all about reading the birds. Yeah. And that's not easy. How they're reacting. Yeah, how they react. Yeah, that's a big deal is watching. Me and Cole, that was probably the past two years was our biggest deal was finding You're out learning the most. What, what, there's some days that ain't going to work versus the other, versus one weekend to the next weekend. Or one, one group to the next group. Exactly. That's really tough. That's what, that's what probably gets my dad irritated the most is because he likes, he just likes consistency. He's, yeah. He just wants to, he's just out there having a good time. Yeah. So if we're, you know, one group of widget is just, just does it right and just comes into 10 yards. We just lay into him. And then two more widget come out, and they're just messing with us for 30 minutes. He's like, what are we doing wrong out here? Yeah. Not, what's going on here? And so I'm like, yeah, they're just they're, they're, they're animals. Yeah. You ain't going to do nothing about them. So I think reading the birds this year this year and last year was like when to pull the mojo out. Because the year before, the couple years before that, we just were like, 
throw the decoys out. Same thing every time. The, same thing exact every time, which that does work, mm-hmm. like you said. It works and then it don't work. It works and it don't exactly. work. Exactly. Yeah. We'd have successful, we'd have not successful, which we, we've had pretty, we had pretty, we had success with yeah, that. You guys picked it up fast. We did. Yeah. Yeah, for Big sure. Big time. Um, okay. Well, we're already 35 minutes in. Let's let's go into, so, how you're 19? Yeah, 19 will be 20 in January. Okay, getting close then. Actually, you're closer to 20 than you are the other way now. I know. <laughs> Crazy, huh? <laughs> so, <coughs> you're obviously been graduate high school. You've been in the work field and force. Um, what do you have planned for the future as far as a career, and what it, what's it going to take to get there, and what do you what are you thinking? So my my goals right now, I'm gonna work. I'm gonna I'm working toward to getting them um, becoming a deputy for the CHP California Highway Patrol. Um. I've always been interested in law enforcement, military, military mainly from the beginning, Air Force, Marines, whatever. But uh, as I kind of went along, got a little more sense about me. But uh, my dad was really pushing for the CHP. I wanted to be more of a – I didn't want to go anywhere. I wanted to stay in our county our, where we were at. wanted to become a deputy sheriff mm. for Merced County. But dad was all like, "There's you can do better. So he was really pushing for that. So that's kind of where things have led up to. As far as my career, mm-hmm. yeah. So you're so you're how on a on a percentage scale? How for sure are you gonna pursue that? One hundred percent. Like no one doubt. A, one no doubt. I've always I've always had a drive and a passion for military first responders. That's just that's right up my alley. Mm-hmm. It's kind of what I've always been drawn to just my whole life. So what's it going to take? What's the process? Because I know we were talking the other night around the campfire and yeah. apologize for all the bugs attacking us. It's, oh, it's terrible. Barney, I've been swatting the whole episode. It's driving me nuts. Now I'm getting the size probably why they left me, but I'm going to cook now. But what um, what's the process going to take for you? Because do you have to be 21? So that's kind of where I'm at right now is kind of in just a waiting stage. I'm going to get my uh, GED So because my – High school diploma isn't accredited, so you have to get something that supplements for high school. They see that I've went through high school, but it's just not accredited, so you want your GED. And mm. then I have um, three quarters of an AA degree in college, so I have okay. that kind of already set up if I want to go that go that route. Are still. you going to finish that? I don't I don't need to, but if, if it helps me, I will. They're more of what I've been told is that it's not really a training. There's nothing – you could take, like, classes like criminology – stuff like that if you wanted to, but it doesn't really help as far as the hands-on stuff with the CHP. It's kind of where they're at with it. But the process of getting to that point, you have to be 21 to become a deputy. You can be 20 and start the process of becoming a deputy. So go through academy. Can you you can that. be in the academy at 20. Yes. yes. So you're not that far away, though. No, I'm not. So, okay, I'm not I meaning to cut you off, but I, I know we had the conversation already offline, but – I'm trying to sit here and figure out the timeline because I'm sure you've already got it dialed. Like, yeah. I'll do this right here, this right here. I mean, nothing's a guarantee. Obviously, you got to pass all the tests, and that, and you're super smart, so I know that's not be a problem. But what? When's the soonest you can do something to get this, like twenty and a half, or like, or now probably because yeah. if you can do it when you're twenty, yeah, then. I mean, you could literally do it next year, right? Yeah. No, that's that's the that's the plan right now. I'm gonna get kind of the preliminaries done so which is what so you have you have your you have to have obviously have your education then you have to what's called to go through like their i know you probably the biggest related thing would be like your pg e like your those tests you do before mm-hmm. so you the first test one of the first tests is a physical okay you go through physical then you go through a, <clears throat> a mental and like or a psychological um then you go through what's like um like a very long descriptive background test so they look that takes forever huh? it takes a long time that's the biggest deal because they go back all the way till you were born almost basically yeah yeah they've been able to make sure you know you're you're clean that's there's that and then there's um oh um english test because you have to do obviously a lot of a lot of writing mm. a lot of grammar they that's a big deal they like making sure eyes are dotted T's right. across big deal with you know writing stuff out you know, reports, tickets, whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of where that's at. Then you go, once you get all that done, you go onto a wait list for the academy. But what the good thing right now with that is what's got going for me is um the guy that um 
kind of is helping me get through the process. Mm -hmm. A friend of my dad's, he, um, they're, they're short. Like they're so shorthanded. Are they still hiring right now? There's, they're, they're running people through the system faster than they ever have. Mm. It's kind of like, they're just taking whoever, whatever. Same thing with, um, sheriff and police. Yeah, Same exact it's thing. It's desperate. They're desperate. They're really desperate. It's a rough time to be in it law is. enforcement. Right it now. is. It yeah. is because there's just there's not enough officers just out there in the field. Mm. Yeah. So okay. So when's the so the first thing the very first thing you do is take that test. Yeah. Take take which my, is the writ like what is that which one is I forget that? I, I'm, I had I had it written down my, I have it written down if I'm about to go look at it but it's like. I forget the order it is. It's um, but you one of the first things you do is the physical, but it's it's not a really hard physical. Mm. It's not that big a deal. But then, how do you get lined up to do that? You go, you go, you go apply. So you have to apply and even get accepted first, to even be able to do that. No, you you really you can you can do all the plan. The biggest thing getting accepted is the academy. Get up there and getting what you can go through all the that they'll they'll get get your test whatever they'll run you through all that. No problem. Like okay. that's a guaranteed. But getting accepted into the academy is probably the biggest deal. Now that's not the post academy, right? I thought CHP has their own academy. CHP has their own. Academy. Yeah, so you're not at the post academy. No. Now will that one carry over to every other one? I'm assuming it does. Or no? You know what? I don't. I don't know that. I feel like it would. I feel like I've heard it does. I don't know. But anyways, yeah, something to look into. Yeah. But anyways, um, okay. So when can you? apply like is, so that's your next step right yeah i could i <clears throat> or when I, do you plan on applying i'm gonna do it when i'm 20 okay the main thing is i i don't have any family in law enforcement whatsoever first generation so the fine the process is really probably going to be difficult for me mm -hmm. just kind of because i don't have an inside right point on this. i didn't either flying helicopters I yeah it was... it's, it's kind of it makes it kind of tough but i mean you got to do what you got to do but i think uh the next step i i don't I don't know if you can do all that before you're 20. I'm assuming you can, but you can't even become a deputy till you're 21. Right. And the pro the, the academy is six months, six months. So you go five days a week. You stay in Sacramento, and you have the weekends off, Saturday and Sunday. But Saturday and Sunday is not really off because you're studying. Yeah. So it's not kind of one of those type of deals. I do have a couple of buddies that went through it. Well, one didn't stick with it just because he kind of I think he had a little bit of an attitude problem. And so he didn't have patience for people. It's a lot. It's a lot related. They say to the, to boot camp or military. Mm. That's what that. That's what he said. It's like no. I mean, he finished and was in the field for a year oh, and he really? quit really? because people. He just, and I, I, I feel like I already knew that was the kind of guy yeah. he was. You know, you got to be able to realize people are stupid. Some people are stupid. Exactly. People make mistakes. People say things. I mean, doesn't sound. I'm not saying it's fun all the time, but I'm just no. saying like he just didn't have the patience for that. No, so definitely def got to be patient. You definitely gonna have a have to have a a good side people part of you for yeah. sure. You got to be good with people. Yeah, and I mean that's a hard deal because most of the time you're writing tickets, <laughs> <laughs> so it's like you're not really ever gonna be loved. I don't think. Now the other side of it, I mean, there is good things they do though. I mean, yeah. right? They, so there's certain things with accents. They're the first on scene, and I do believe you got to be all that EMT or not EMT certified, um, uh, uh, CPR and yeah. all. Yeah, so. And I know of guys that have had to do that stuff, and you could save people and help people. So, mm -hmm. but so you're so you are you thinking what's the earliest you can apply? You think what's your plan? I, th I think I can apply as young as I want, but I think they're not going to accept me until I'm 20 anyway because it's just it's a long. So you, you just like on went around when you turn 20, you're going to kind of something. Yeah, and I, I'm it was this is my first year from graduating high school, so I kind of wanted to give like a what is that like a cushion kind of yeah, just kind of a. Okay, just get everything squared away. Yep. Get 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 your foot in the ground, and then we'll we'll go into this head first. Duck on a few times here and get, there. Get my get my one more season in. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what, dude? That's a good call because I would tell everybody the same thing. Yeah. I mean, I know you guys are hard workers, so there's not an issue. If someone wasn't a hard worker, that'd be a little more concerned. But there is nothing wrong with enjoying enjoying your life. youth and yeah. <clears throat> life and. Because you're going to have a career for a lot longer than you were not. Exactly. So, yeah, do I think someone should sit around and do nothing until they're 25? No, I don't think so at all. But you're 19. You just graduated. You work in full time. Yeah. You've got a job. So it's not like you're not doing nothing. But, man, take advantage of the time you have because all yeah. it's going to do is get busier the older you get. You know that. Kids, wife, or girlfriend, wife, family, bills. It just adds up. Never, and never it's not ends. a bad thing. Right. It's life. 
Yeah. And, but um, it's part of growing up. Yeah, just just do all you can do and put it on. I mean, you guys do that. Like since we've been up here, you've been. Sh- sh- sh. <laughs> when I asked you today is a good day for a podcast, you're like. Let me check my schedule. Well, I, found out, I found out I was staying until Saturday, so I was all like, maybe I'll get when we're hiking or something. Yeah. You got any ideas where you think you might go? I thought about going to a like a lake or something, but I think I think I'm just gonna stay around camp and just chill. Hang out with young people and stuff. Yeah. So. Right on. Yeah, you you put some you've done did you go with us to you went with us to Grays yesterday? Yeah, went to yeah. Grays and then the day before we went to uh that lake. Uh, what's it called? Cordwood. Cordwood, and then I've had that big, long overnight trip to the San Joaquin. Yeah. Yeah, how was that one? Uh, That's your second time down there? That's my second time down there. So me and Cole were the only ones that had been down I took three other guys. My, one of, one's my cousin. We took. They've never been down there, so it was the first time I ever led an expedition. <laughs> <laughs> How'd it go? It was good. It was good. We had problems kind of going down the, the roads up to that point, which is really frustrating. But um, they were not maintained. Trees were down everywhere. We took like what should have been a forty-five minute drive turned into three hours. Cutting yeah. trees up, getting them out of the way, so we can crawl through this dirt road. But I'll go in. Someone was glad you did it. Yeah, cleared the trees. Actually, literally after since we cleared one of the main roads, a car literally from the other side, from the other end, was all like, "Are you guys going through here cleaning trees?" I was like, "Yeah, you lucky sucker dog." Yeah. <laughs> all right. So yeah. Yeah. Well, cool, man. Thanks for coming on. I'm. uh I was telling you, I kind of want to document some of the CHP things because the next time you come on, I, know. I mean, you maybe the next time you come on, maybe you're in the middle of the process or maybe you're in the academy or maybe you're done by the next time. I don't know, but good luck with that. And uh, I know you'll do good if that's what you set your mind to. I'm I'm a firm believer. If someone sets their mind to it, you exactly. can do it. There's no doubt. You have it's not grit. a question. Now have enough grit, another, enough hard work in you. You can do just about anything you want to do. Yep, I 100% agree with that. So thanks for coming on, man. I enjoyed this talk and the good laugh. <laughs> well, don't we'll just ask God not to take away the desire. <laughs> but just don't yeah. let it come between me and him. <laughs> yeah, that's all you gotta do. As long as you don't let that and don't become an idol to you, you're good to go. <laughs> good. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you guys in the next one.